Hi guys, welcome to the webinar, Can I Avoid Knee Surgery? Uh, my name is Mel Svarnik. I'm the clinic director and partner at the Renew Physical Therapy Clinic on State Street. So uh, we are gonna go through the presentation. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, there should be a Q&A button that you can click on. And at the end of the presentation, I will try to answer as many questions as I can and hopefully answer them in a way that will help you to improve your understanding of the topic. So just a brief introduction. Um, myself, I'm uh, originally from South Africa. I uh, came to the United States in 1994 and uh, I've worked in Saginaw since that time. I've been with Renew Physical Therapy since 2013. And um, as far as my schooling goes, I did my entry level schooling in South Africa, but I did do a two year graduate, a graduate certificate in manual therapy at Oakland University. And then I completed my transitional doctorate at Oakland as well. So um, as far as the, our clinic goes, we do typically see patients for, with orthopedic conditions, musculoskeletal type of issues. Uh, we see people with, people with neurological issues, for example, uh, people who have balance problems. And then we also do have a, a specialist who deals with pelvic health issues. So um, if you do need to uh, set up an appointment, um, you can always go online and there's contact information. Um, and if, you, if you're still not sure how to access that, we, will, we should be able to get that out to you. If, if, so if you're having any issues, please feel, to, feel free to um, let us know uh, um, that you are looking for a phone number and we'll, and we'll get that out to you. All right, so let's get started. Can I avoid knee surgery? So some of the objectives that we are hoping to achieve um, through this presentation is that you should be able to identify some common anatomical structures that produce knee pain, hopefully distinguish between the common structural causes of knee pain, and then improve your understanding of knee conditions that may require surgery. So if we, we're gonna go into the anatomy of the knee joint, the knee is a two joint structure. So the main part of the knee joint actually consists of the femur, which is the largest bone in your body, articulating with the tibia, which is the second largest bone in your body. Um, we also have another joint that uh, actually is involved in movement um, of the knee joint, and that is called the patellofemoral joint. And that is where the patella or kneecap articulates with the femur. So if we look further into anatomy and we look at a frontal view of the knee, there's a few structures we can look at. So right over here, looking from the front, you can see the patella, which is the kneecap, like I mentioned. And as you can see, it's directly in front of the lower part of the femur. And it has on the underneath side of it, it has some articular cartilage that allows it to articulate with that femur. Um, the most common cause of pain in the front of the knee typically is due to a patellofemoral issue. Um, and that is something that oftentimes can be quite uh, limiting for patients. So oftentimes it's, it's one of those issues that we do have to address. Some other structures that could be causing pain could be uh, if you look at the lower part of that, that thigh muscle, the quadriceps muscle, um, that can be problematic. The tendon that the muscle attaches to the, the kneecap, both above and below. So up here we have the quadriceps tendon and below that we have the patellar tendon. Those structures can become inflamed and can also cause, cause knee pain as you would expect. There is also something called an infrapatella fat pad and that is directly behind the patellar tendon and the, um, and the kneecap itself. So, uh, there's actually a side view here, which is quite nice. So it kind of fits into this space right in here. And sometimes that uh, fat pad can get inflamed uh, because it might be impinged or, or stuck or not, not moving as well as it should. Um, the other structures that potentially could be problematic in terms of producing pain could be the anterior horns of the meniscus on either side. We, we typically have a lateral and medial meniscus and we'll look more at that later in terms of how it looks from a different view. But sometimes those structures can be a source of pain. So these are just some of the structures that can be causing to your pain in the front of the knee. 
um, probably the, the most common ones that we'd expect to see. If we go to the next slide and look at the side of the knee, so looking from the outside uh, of, of the knee, um, there's some structures that potentially could be producing pain. Number one is this structure right here. It's called the lateral collateral ligament. Um, I will be discussing this in more detail a little bit later in this presentation, but the ligamentous structure of the knee um, really, all the, the, the main ligaments of the knee are really are important in terms of stability of the knee. Um, and I'll explain why a little bit later, but this structure on the outside oftentimes can be a problem, especially in athletes who have taken a hit or who have twisted their knee or fallen in a certain way. And it causes um, some or all, all of the uh, fibers of that tendon to tear. Um, and obviously when that happens, that can be problematic, not only in terms of uh, causing pain, but also in terms of stability of the knee. You cannot really see it on this slide, but coming along down the side of the femur down here and attaching into the tibia, you'll get something called the iliotibial band. And oftentimes that can be a source of discomfort for patients. Um, a lot of times it, it happens with uh, runners, um, but it's not you know, exclusive to runners. It can oftentimes happen uh, in individuals who have problems with weakness in their hips because that band actually connects to some of the, uh, the big muscles uh, in the gluteal region. And when there's weakness in those muscles, it causes mechanical issues, which can, be, uh, which can result in pain in that structure. Um, the lateral meniscus would kind of be sitting in this area here. And you can actually, there's a, there's a uh, little uh, link to it there or a little descriptor right there that points to the meniscus right there. So because that meniscus kind of goes all the way around the joint line, the outside of that lateral meniscus can sometimes be the reason why you might be having pain on the outside of your knee. And then if you think about all the muscular structures uh, in the thigh and in the lower leg, any one of those muscles can potentially be a source of pain. So you can see um, there's, we've got the, the quadriceps muscle up here, but you will also have part of the quadriceps coming down on to the side of that, that femur there. The lateral hamstrings will be a little bit uh, behind that structure. We've talked about the iliotibial band. And then down here below the knee joint, you would have the uh, calf muscles. The gastrocnemius muscle um, is the biggest um, component of the calf muscle. And there's some other muscles, both in front of the tibia and on the side of the tibia that could potentially be sources of pain uh, on the outside of the knee. The next slide shows the back of the knee and this slide really focuses more on muscular structures. Uh, if you look at the structures above the knee joint here, you can see that um, there's a lot of different really strange names that we see there. And really these names are just components of the hamstring muscles. So most people would know them simply as the hamstring muscles. Um, but if we get fancy, there's actually specific names for the individual muscles in that muscle group. Uh, so semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and biceps femoris are um, the components of the hamstrings. The calf muscles below the knee joint right here, gastrocnemius, um, also potential sources of pain. So if you strain the muscle, uh, that could cause some inflammation and some pain and some weakness, obviously. Uh, the back of the knee joint oftentimes will have a structure in some individuals, um, namely, and I'm sure most people might be familiar with this, uh, called the Baker's cyst. And that is typically just a fluid-filled cyst that can sometimes be benign, so it may not cause any pain, but it could also at times be painful. And if it gets really swollen, it can even restrict knee motion. And oftentimes this might be associated with an issue on the inside of the knee. So the if we're thinking about the, the knee joint being a capsule, so you've got ligamentous structures surrounding that knee joint. If you get swelling within that knee, sometimes there's a little stalk um, that communicates with that little cyst that occurs on the outside of that joint capsule. And that might be why you get the swelling and the pain. 
Uh, there's another little muscle that's not in this diagram called um, popliteus. And that muscle's a very small muscle. Most people have never heard of it, but it's important in terms of the, of the unlocking of the knee from a fully extended position into a flex position. So it really is an, an important muscle that plays a role in the knee joint mechanics in terms of movement. And if that is uh, strained or if it's stiff, that can cause problems with the mechanics of the knee. Um, as far as articular structures, the posterior horns of the menisci can also be sources of pain in that knee joint. All right, and finally, we're gonna go to the inside of the knee joint. This also tends to show more of the muscular and ten tenderness structures. And you can see in this diagram that there's been a, some of the muscles have been cut away. Uh, and this just shows you the structure uh, right here. And, and if you look at this little blue structure here, that's actually a bursa. So a bursa is a type of a grease pad, if you will, that helps with lubrication and usually occurs in multiple areas of the body. You, I'm sure you've all heard the term bursitis. What can tend to happen sometimes in the, in, in the bursa or in the structures around the bursa, the fascia, you get inflammation of those structures and that, that can be quite painful. This particular structure right here is called the pes anserine bursa, which just is a Latin word, which means goose's foot. So when, when you have this intact, and if you have a diagram that shows it fully intact, it actually looks like a goose's foot. Um, but these muscles uh, are different muscles coming from different structures. So the one, one of the muscles is uh, the semitendinosus, which we mentioned earlier, it's one of the hamstring muscles. Another muscle, uh, is the gracilis. So that's the muscle right here that would attach right over that spot. And then the final one is called sartorius, which is a muscle which is superficial to the quadriceps muscles. And they all join in the kind of the same spot. And they can oftentimes be a source of pain and tenderness uh, in that part of the knee. Other structures that could be causing pain would be the other adductor muscles, which are the muscles on the inside of the thigh, the inside of the quadriceps muscle, which would be right there, the inside calf muscle or gastrocnemius right there, and then some of the other hamstring muscles. And uh, we shouldn't forget the, the articular structures too. So the, the cartilage or the medial meniscus could be a source of pain in that region. All right, let's move on to some common sources of knee pain in general. So, if you're thinking about structural components of the knee, um, we, we would be talking cartilage, ligaments, and tendons. So if we're just talking about cartilage, um, we consider two different types of cartilage in the knee joint. So we consider the articular cartilage and the meniscal cartilage. So the articular cartilage just refers to the lining of the, the two joint structures that we talked about. So the tibiofemoral joint and the patellofemoral joint actually have lining um, cartilage lining with synovial membranes over the top of those, which help with um, lubrication. And typically cartilage is, uh, when it's intact and when it's healthy, there are not a lot of nerve endings in cartilage itself. But when it starts to break down, what tends to happen is uh, the bone underneath the cartilage, which is called subchondral bone, can be exposed. And that subchondral bone actually has a lot of little nerve endings. And as a result, when those structures are uh, further stressed, that can actually result in those signals being transmitted to the brain. And, and we perceive that as pain. So when you have arthritis resulting in breakdown of the cartilage, it tends to be more painful for that reason. And along with the fact that you, know, you have pain with, with the loading of that joint, Obviously, it will also affect the ability of that joint to move in a smooth and efficient way as well. The other type of cartilage that is present in the knee joint is, uh, is called the meniscus. And we, I've, I've touched on this already in previous slides. But if you look at the, the meniscus structures here, it's kind of like they are crescent shaped um, and wedge, kind of wedge. If you look at a different angle, they are actually wedge shaped structures that are important for a couple of different reasons. Number one, they are important to help with load bearing in the knee joint. 
And number two, they actually increase, increase the joint congruency. So what do I mean by joint congruency? If you think about the, just purely look at it at the bony structures of the knee joint, and we're talking about the, the tibiofemoral joint in particular. So the femur is right here, the tibia is right here. If you think about how rounded this femur is right here, and then the tibia is relatively flat, but it's, it has a slight concavity to accept that femoral um, bone right there. But even so, because it's a relatively flat surface here and a really rounded surface here, they don't really fit together very well. Uh, and what the meniscus does is it actually helps to envelop that femur because it sits right on top of the tibia here. And that helps it, the femur to fit onto that tibia uh, in a way that makes it slightly more stable. The other ligaments, the other big ligament, ligaments that we will talk about are also very important because they do help to provide a greater degree of stability um, that goes way beyond just the shape of the bones themselves. So if you think about uh, another joint like the hip joint, which has is a ball and socket type of joint, uh, and the, the ball of that femur fits really nicely into the acetabulum, which is the, the pelvis. It's, uh, just by looking at bony anatomy, that hip joint is a much more stable structure than the knee joint is. So the knee joint really is reliant on the ligamentous structures for the stability of that joint. And so when you have a rupture of one of those ligaments, that can be very problematic. Okay, so if we think about uh, cartilage being a source of pain, um, they may tend to present in a specific way in terms of how you will feel if you have articular cartilage pain versus meniscal pain. Um, these statements are kind of generalized, but oftentimes do point to a particular structure. So if we think about articular pain, we would expect to have kind of a dull, achy kind of pain. The pain will tend to be fairly diffuse. And in other words, you can't point to a particular spot where in the knee or around the knee where it might be painful. There may be swelling associated with articular cartilage pain. And oftentimes it will be worse with stair negotiation. So going up or down stairs, if we, if we think in specifically about the articular cartilage on the patellofemoral joint, uh, that patellofemoral joint gets very loaded when we are going downstairs. So if you think about having your right foot on a step and you're stepping down with the left foot, that right knee flexes and is under an incredible amount of load because that quadricep muscle is contracting, which kind of really pushes that kneecap into that femur which resulting a, result in a lot of loading. Uh, and it's, it's definitely more loaded going downstairs than going upstairs. So we would expect if it's a patellofemoral issue that you might complain of uh, having more difficulty going downstairs. Meniscal pain, especially if it's, a, it's an acute type of issue, will tend to be a little bit sharper. We'd expect to have more pain along the joint line, depending on where, which meniscus is involved and where in the meniscus uh, uh, it is affected. We would expect to see um, swelling oftentimes, not always. Oftentimes patient will complain of a catching or locking of the knee and that usually would occur if there is a tear in the meniscus which results in part of that meniscus becoming looser and kind of being like a flap or even if it totally breaks away it may actually result in that knee joint getting locked up. Oftentimes worse with stairs, because remember we talked about how the meniscus really does play an important role in load bearing. Patients also complain of having increased pain when they pivot on that knee. And sometimes they complain of a feeling of instability with the meniscus issue. All right, so let's move on to the ligament structures. So the big, the main ligaments, and there are many ligaments, these aren't the only ligaments in the knee, but the, the main ligaments, when we're talking about structural integrity for the, for the knee joint, uh, the tibiofemoral joint in particular are going to be the lateral collateral ligament, which is this structure right here, the medial collateral ligament, and then the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. So it's difficult to see the posterior cruciate ligament on this diagram, but the anterior cruciate ligament is right in this area. Posterior cruciate ligaments kind of behind it, and they do kind of cross over, and that's why they call them the cruciate ligaments. So as I mentioned, the, the tibiofemoral joint it does rely on these ligaments for stability. All right, 
So if we're talking about ligamentous pain related to those types of ligaments, and once again, this is generalized. This won't always be this, the case in terms of what you're feeling, but if you have an acute injury, often with ligamentous issues or injuries, you will typically tend to have a sharp pain. The collateral ligaments may be located primarily in the joint line region, whereas the cruciate, because they are more within the joint capsule, will tend to feel like a deep uh, pain within the knee joint. Patients will typically complain of an instability when, when they are walking. Um, with the collaterals, we would possibly expect to, uh, a sensation of feeling like the knee is given out sideways. Um, whereas with the cruciates, we would, you know, patients would say, you know, feel like the knee is buckling or giving out. The collaterals, by the way, do play a role not only in, in the side-to-side -side stability, they do have a, a role in rotational stability of the knee. So once again, this is just generalizing and, and, and describing what typical or common symptoms might uh, be like. Uh, with the collaterals, we might expect joint line swelling, well, whereas with the cruciate ligament injuries, uh, the whole knee would tend to swell and we would get what's called a joint effusion. Uh, oftentimes patients uh, describe the sensation of like a, a balloon within the knee joint when they have a collateral, uh, sorry, a cruciate um, rupture, a ACL or PCL rupture. This is just going over some of the muscles and tendons, which we have touched on already in terms of describing the hamstrings, the quadriceps. Uh, I don't believe I have it on, in, in the following slides, but you know, the gastrocnemius muscles, which is part of the calf muscles, are also very important in terms of function of the knee. Um, so if we look at the hamstrings and the quadriceps in terms of what they might feel like in terms of pain, once again, if it's an acute type of injury, we would expect to, the patient to complain of sharp pain. Hamstrings are behind the knee joint, so we'd expect the patient to complain of pain behind the knee with a hamstring issue, whereas in the quadriceps, we'd expect pain to be felt in front of that knee. Um, with both quadriceps and hamstrings, you do have these structures um, being on the inside and on the outside of the thigh, but hamstrings obviously are more posterior and quadriceps are more in the front of the um, thigh. So if it is an acute issue, oftentimes what happens with an acute strain, you get an inflammatory response to that, to that strain. And when you've been sleeping overnight, you may have increased pain in the morning because that inflammation has not had a chance to be dissipated with movement. Once you start to move, uh, it tends to loosen up a little bit and feel better. But by the end of the day, because that loading and wearing and tearing of, of those structures has um, occurred, it tends to be more sore um, again. Similarly, with the, the iliotibial band and the hip adductors, uh, we would expect sharp pain uh, with an acute injury. Uh, the IT band is going to be on the, you know, you'll expect to feel that on the outside of the knee, whereas with the hip adductors, which do uh, go down towards the knee, we would expect it on the inside of the knee because that's where those structures are situated. So we've talked about some structures uh, that can be uh, responsible for knee pain. And we've talked about mo mo mostly local structures, but we also as therapists have to consider that there could be other structures that are a little bit further away from the, from the knee that can be the cause of knee pain. So if we look at some possible remote causes of knee pain, as a therapist, depending on how the patient describes their knee pain and what makes it worse or what makes it better, we may take a look at the lower back because you could have an issue with a nerve root in the lower back is irritated or it's even more than irritated, it might be compressed and that can actually cause pain in the knee, especially if it's uh, obviously if it's a nerve root that actually supplies the sensation to that knee joint, we would expect that the patient may have pain that could be felt in the knee. Oftentimes, if, if it is this type of issue, the patient may also describe other symptoms like pain running down the leg all the way down to the foot or numbness or tingling and so on and so forth. The hip joint itself can also refer pain to the knee. So you may have arthritis in the hip and the patient may actually sometimes not even feel pain in the hip joint, but they may feel it in the knee joint. If we are looking at the anatomy of the muscles in the leg, 
we have to consider the fact that many muscles do cross over both the hip joint and the knee joint. So if you have weakness in certain muscles, that can actually cause issues in both joints. So a lot of times when patients come in to see me with knee pain, I will check uh, a lot of the hip muscles. And uh, if, if we talk about all the different structures that could cross over both joints, we look if we're looking at the front, the quadricep muscle, um, one of the, the big components of the quad muscle does cross over both hip and knee. The IT band that I talked about actually attaches to some of the outside hip muscles and it helps with the mechanics of the knee joint because it goes and attaches below that knee joint. The hamstring muscles attach above the hip joint and below the knee joint. And then the hip adduct adductors, one of the big hip addu adductor muscles, which were, I mentioned earlier, gracilis, actually uh, attaches above the hip joint, but inserts below the knee joint. Mechanical issues at the foot, like overpronation, so when your foot really flattens too much, that can actually cause a mechanical issue at the knee joint. Or if you do the opposite, where you have a high arch and your foot doesn't flatten at all when you're stepping, that can cause problems at the knee joint. Um, people who tend to oversupinate have less of a shock absorption effect. because so, so your foot is normally supposed to pronate and supinate. So the pronation part of the, the, the foot uh, is, is partially to help with shock absorption as you step. Uh, and then supination helps with the foot locking and helps with propulsion. But if you have too much overpronation, it can cause stress in the knee joint. If you have too much supination where there's not enough uh, pronation, that can actually result in less shock absorption, which can result in problems with at the knee joint, uh, as well as other joints above, that, like the hip joint and, and the sacroiliac joint on the back and so on and so forth. So how can physical therapy help? So as you, I'm sure many of you, of you are familiar with uh, the fact that in physical therapy, we do a lot of exercises. So if you come into therapy and we find that there's weakness, we can do a lot of strengthening. Uh, a lack of range of motion, we'll obviously try to improve your range of motion by doing joint mobility or doing muscle stretching types of things. Uh, I think I've alluded to the fact that the knee joint is a very important uh, part uh, of load bearing. So it plays an important role in load bearing. And so if you have pain related to any one of those articular structures and when you're stepping or standing or doing stuff and it increases your pain, there are things that we can do to help you to unload that knee joint and make it feel better. So there are some self-traction techniques, which just basically means that we are helping you to just gently distract the joint surfaces. And by doing that, helping to reduce inflammation, reduce pain. Um, in, in our clinic, we have something called an unweighted treadmill, which basically we, we hook you up to a, a treadmill, which helps to take the weight off your body. And in particular, the load bearing joints like the hip, the knee, and, and some of the back structures. Aqua therapy is another example of unloading that we can do. If you have any swelling within the knee joint, we can do circulatory exercises that do help to uh, facilitate lymphatic drainage and help to reduce that swelling. Proprioceptive re-education refers to balance activities. Uh, proprioception is an important function that your body relies on um, to help you uh, accurately place your foot when you're walking or running or doing any type of athletic activity. And if we don't re-educate that, that can lead to re-injury. So that's an important part of the whole rehabilitation process. And then obviously we, we, we would wanna do some type of functional mobility and strengthening activity, uh, which helps uh, you to return to your normal work activities or your normal daily activities that you may do at home, or if you're an athlete, to be able to return to your sporting activities. Some other types of physical therapy techniques that we can do would include manual therapy techniques such as joint mobilizations. Um, you'll see in there that I've mentioned glides. So when you have a limited uh, ability to bend or straighten the knee, um, what happens in the knee joint is you get what's called a roll glide. So the, the shape of that knee joint allows the joint to roll, but it also needs to glide. So the joint surfaces glide um, when they move. And so if you imagine the knee joint, so if we've got the femur right here. I don't know if you guys can see this uh, because this is a little small, but 
this tends to happen with the knee joint. So if you have the, the tibia down here and the femur here, when you're flexing, there's a gliding motion that happens. And sometimes what happens is that gliding motion gets restricted. So by doing a gliding mobilization, we can actually help to improve the motion in the knee. The traction or, or unloading techniques just simply refer to us gently distracting the knee joint surfaces. And, and that, as I've mentioned before, helps with re reduction of pain uh, and inflammation uh, for those articular surfaces and, and the meniscus structures as well. Soft tissue mobilization, the massage techniques that we can do to help loosen up tight or painful muscles can be helpful. Functional massage refers to uh, massaging the muscles as we are moving the joint. So if we lengthen or shorten muscles by moving the joint and then massage at the same time, that can actually be very helpful in terms of improving mobility and reducing pain and inflammation. Trigger point release refers to uh, pressing on a tender or tight muscle uh, component and that oftentimes is very helpful in helping to reduce pain. And then myofascial release refers to actually just releasing tension within the myofascial structure. So the connective tissue that surrounds those muscle structures can sometimes get bound down, especially if uh, patients or individuals have had a long period of immobility or, and pain. And by releasing that tissue, it does help to improve function um, because of less pain and more mobility. And then the obvious uh, ones that some people think of sometimes are the heat in the eyes, the electrical stimulation, the ultrasound modalities, which can be helpful in terms of um, reducing inflammation and pain. Something that um, patients aren't too aware of is something that we call prehabilitation or prehab for short. So if you are, and I just, this just refers to uh, having a short course of physical therapy prior to a scheduled surgery. So if, if you're scheduled to go in for a particular surgery, it's not a bad idea to come into therapy or at least to try to do some type of exercises. Uh, if you're not in, in therapy, that should be um, okayed by your physician or surgeon. But what the prehab does is it actually helps to increase your mobility and your strength. It may improve balance. It may help to improve your energy levels. And by doing all that, it actually helps with your recovery following surgery. So it may help to shorten hospital stays. It'll improve your ability to recover following the surgery and it'll uh, increase physical and mental strength. So prehabilitation is something that is a little bit uh, underrated. And I think uh, a lot of insurance companies may not uh, be on, on board with it, but I think it's something that is becoming more um, uh, and people are becoming more aware of it at, at this stage because it can actually help in terms of re recovery time following surgery. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some research studies that I found online. And these were just comparing uh, groups of people who were randomized into a couple of different uh, treatment types for meniscal injuries. So. The types of meniscus injuries that these people had were, not, were termed uh, non-obstructive meniscus tears, which means that there was no disruption of the meniscus in terms of uh, part of the meniscus breaking loose or flapping into the joint, which would typically uh, we would typically expect uh, with people who have a lot of catching or locking. But they did have a lot of pain with these issues. And by breaking these uh, two, two groups of people into either a physical therapy group or a surgery group, they found that in one of the studies after six months, both, both groups of people had improved in terms of their function. In another study, they compared the two groups after two years following physical therapy and surgery. And they found that the people in the physical therapy group had the same amount of functional improvement in terms of the people uh, who had the surgery. And so what does that mean? What that means is surgery uh, can be a very expensive uh, option. And obviously it's a much more invasive type of treatment. Um, so if you can get the same results by going into physical therapy, uh, you can, it's gonna be much more cost effective and it's gonna be a much less invasive type of treatment. Um, and so that just goes to show that, you know, sometimes physical therapy is, is, is a good um, cost effective option to try first. 
That's not to say that everybody, you know, you, we, we're not going to offer a guarantee that physical therapy will 100% of the time prevent you from having surgery, but it is a relatively low uh, cost alternative to attempt. And, and oftentimes patients do really get a lot of benefit out of therapy. Now, having said all that, there, this, you know, no one's going to deny that there certainly are many conditions that may require surgery. So if you've had a, a fracture of the bones around the, 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 the knee joint, you may require surgery to reduce the fracture and internally fix that, that fracture. Cruciate ruptures, typically, especially if you're going to be somebody that's going to be active, and especially for athletes who want to return to their athletic activities, they are going to need to have surgery to repair those ruptures. Collateral ligament ruptures, same thing. The, you, you, we talked about how those uh, main ligaments really are important for stability of the knee. And if you do not have good stability and, and, and if those ligaments are not intact, it's going to really prevent you from being able to return to your sporting activities or to activities that may require a lot of movement and loading of the knee joint. There are other ligamentous ruptures that can be um, uh, require the need that may require the need for surgery. Uh, a good example that I haven't really mentioned in the presentation is a patellofemoral ligament. If that tears, that can actually uh, result in uh, poor gliding of that kneecap uh, and pain and, and potentially result in dislocation of that kneecap. And so surgery oftentimes is a good option for that. Certain types of meniscal tears that uh, result in obstruction within the knee joint or disruption of that meniscus to the point where um, you know you actually need to go in and clean it up may be may require surgery and then the obviously if you have a muscle or tendon rupture that's going to um, really limit your ability to move that knee joint in, a, in an efficient way surgery oftentimes is the only option for that sometimes severe arthritis does require surgery. So the types of surgeries that may be involved in those types of conditions would be either an arthroscopic surgery where they would go in and clean the joint out. We call that joint debridement, or they may go in and do partial or total joint replacements. Oops, skip the slide there. All right, so if you do have an issue where you have uh, a knee injury, what can you do at home to take care of it? So. There are some things that you can do. Um, I'll skip to the, the bottom part of that slide. Rest is probably a really good thing to do um, right off the bat if you've just had a, a bad knee injury. Um, assuming that it's not an injury that uh, requires some type of surgery. So obviously if you've fractured your knee or something like that, you know, you need to see your physician. But if, it, if, if it's more of a, a muscle strain or, or a ligament sprain, that typically may recover on its own. That initial period of rest is, is gonna be a good thing because it's gonna allow that knee joint to, to start healing, start that healing process. Now, when we say rest, we don't mean complete stop of activity because if you rest for too long and you're not moving you know, for a long period of time, that can be problematic too because that could result in stiffness, it could result in weakness. Um, so we talk, when we say rest, we do mean resting in a way that will allow that, lick, that those knee structures to be unloaded, but we still wanna have some degree of motion in those structures, which will facilitate that healing process. So obviously most people know that if you, know, if you, if you hurt your knee or your ankle or, your, or, or any other structure, cold and ice is a, is a good option to try. Um, and that typically refers to re new injuries within the first 72 hours. Self-traction, uh, which I've talked about earlier in this presentation, is a nice um, option to try. And for the knee joint, if you are thinking about trying this, if you find a, a chair that's nice and high, uh, that allows you to sit on the chair and then just let that lower leg and foot dangle, the weight of the lower leg and foot will actually help to dis gently distract that knee joint. So it'll take the, the loading off that, those knee structures and help to uh, relieve some pain. Positioning of the knee joint, if you happen to be lying down, putting a couple of pillows under the knee joint um, puts the knee joint in a more of a resting position, um, which is a, the resting position refers to the, uh, the joint being the least loaded. 
So if you think about the articular surfaces being in contact with each other, the, the best position in terms of an unloaded position would be the knee being flexed at about 30 degrees. And then you've obviously got some topical uh, things that you can apply to, you, to the knee uh, that may help with pain as well. If you do have issues with knee pain that uh, after this initial uh, period of rest and positioning and self-traction and ice has not helped to resolve, therapy may be uh, a solution. We do offer free screens at Renew Physical Therapy. So the nice thing about this is it's totally free as the, the name implies. Um, it doesn't take very long. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes and you do not need a physician referral for this. So you can simply call one of the Renew clinics and we do it at all of our Renew clinics, um, set up an appointment, uh, come in to see the therapist. They will spend about 10 to 15 minutes asking questions and doing some very brief, simple tests. And based on what we find with the questioning and with the quick testing, we can determine if therapy might be helpful for you. If we feel that therapy is going to be helpful, uh, we can either get in touch with your physician or you can get in touch with your physician and ask for a prescription for physical therapy. The nice thing about this is that, you know, you're under no obligation um, to follow through with, with any physical therapy if you don't want to, um, but it does let you know uh, if, if therapy might be helpful for you. All right, so we do have a number of locations that renew physical therapy. So if you go to the website, um, you may be able to find more details in terms of a location closer to you. And at this stage, I think I will open up uh, to some questions. So if Kate has any questions that anyone has um, documented, let me know, Kate. Thanks, Mel. Um, we did have one question. Um, she said, I'm an 88 year old woman in good health, but a very painful knee joint. I've had several cortisone shots in the joint. Will PT be helpful? I know that's a little um, specific, but I don't know if you have anything to say about cortisone shots um, or something you might try. Yeah, so cortisone shots uh, basically are, cortisone is an anti-inflammatory. So what that implies, typically as we get older, our joints do start to break down and there's an inflammatory process that goes along with that. Um, and that's, you know, what we, when we say arthritis, it just basically means inflammation of the joint. And so what the cortisone shots are doing are helping to reduce that inflammation. Physical therapy can be helpful because there is research that shows that uh, strengthening around a joint can be helpful in terms of reducing the effects of arthritis. Just because we have arthritis doesn't mean that it should be painful. Uh, therapy could also be very helpful in terms of relieving pain in this type of situation because uh, we can do some of the unloading techniques that we talked about earlier in the, in the presentation. And that can be either through some of the manual techniques that we, we can do, and we can also show some techniques that the patient can do at home. So yeah, I think it's definitely worth a shot. If you know, if if you're taking, if you happen to have a lot of cortisone shots, um, and obviously the cortisone is going to be a temporary solution because you still have to walk and load bear on that knee. And so once that anti-inflammatory effect wears off, it's you, you you'll tend to get the pain again. Whereas with therapy, if we can help to provide better stability around the knee and improve the motion, uh, that may be helpful in terms of managing the symptoms. So I definitely think therapy would be a great thing to try, for sure. Wonderful, thanks Mel. We don't have any other questions. I do wanna just let people know that we'll be sending out a follow-up email that will have some helpful links on where to find Mel and how to request a free screening a few summary points. Um, but other than that, thank you for presenting for us. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Yep, thanks guys, I've really enjoyed it. Stay safe out there and uh, we'll uh, hopefully be back with another webinar soon. Thanks, Mel. Thank you.